Abuse of executive order and dictatorship go hand in hand, Senator Ikoro Madu expresses concern. And a Doe election is on the front burner again as the Oba of Benin act as the referee. This is Plus Politics. I am Coyote Ladende. Welcome is to Plots Politics. Ike Ekwaramadu has warned against the use of executive orders. The lawmaker said an abuse of the orders have a potential to disrespect existing laws and breed dictators. He said the executive order 10 granting financial independence to the state legislature does not represent the amended constitution and it is contrary to the constitution. He urged the MBA and other stakeholders in the legal profession to monitor how the constitution of the country is being used by the executive. Joining us to discuss this is Monday Ubani, former uh, second vice president of the Nigerian Bar Association, who now explains probably more on what the constitutional provision is. Good evening, MOU, we would like to call you. Yes. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, let's get a perspective from what um, yes. the former uh, uh, Deputy Senate President did say during your conference. I guess your conference is still yes. ongoing anyway. Now, it has come up to bring up something I've, we have seen you mention before in some of your write-ups in the past. What exactly is his concern? Do you share that concern that if no. executive is not well uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, uh, listeners. Thank you, my brother, for having me. Okay. I, I want to say this, that a lot of misconceptions uh, have actually been found by, uh, by some of us who have been advocates of executive order. What is actually executive order? Executive order is an order that is actually used by the executive to carry out a constitutional provision, because there must be a constitutional provision backing an executive to do an act. Now, in doing that act and making it possible, the executive can enact an executive order in order to ensure that the act itself that has been enacted will be carried out in such a manner as to achieve a determined purpose. We have seen executive order being used in America several times by the former president and even by the current president that is actually holding this way, uh, presently in the person of uh, Donald Trump, Donald Trump has signed several executive orders, giving life to some of the policies of the present government in America in order to ensure that what is required of the executive is done, but done in such a manner as to be in tally with an already existing law. But if executive order goes outside an enactment of law, the judiciary, which is the third arm of government, can come in in order to nullify that executive order. In other words, an executive order can also be illegal. But if an executive order is made in such a manner that is clearly in pari pursue with already existing legislation, but for now, the executive wants to carry out that instruction of the legislation in order to give room for efficiency, then there is nothing wrong with the executive order. And we have seen also that our present uh, president has signed several executive orders which to me is not running contrary to any any existing legislation, okay. legislation that is in place. Okay, Mr. Ubani, let's let's look at it from this angle. I, I'm going to cite some issues that have caused some kind of uproar, and I'll get your perspective. Thank God you're not <laughs> you don't belong to any party before we give you the, a political coloration. But looking at what the Kuremado did mention, and I'm quoting some of the things you said in the past. That when you say that uh, this particular order in reference that uh, by President Muhammad Dubari is it, 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 it's, it's giving life to the provision of Section 120, subsection 3 of the 1999 uh, Constitution. You and I know why have we had issues where this financial autonomy are not given to the state legislature, the state judiciary, and it appears nothing is happening. Even these governors have 
you know, giving a body language to the president that this is not going to work. Yes, uh, as I said earlier, in that argument, and that is actually the truth, the 1999 uh, Constitution as amended has actually made express provision as to the uh, financial autonomy of uh, both the legislative assembly and the state judiciary, including the federal judiciary. At the federal level, we have had autonomy of the National Assembly over time. We have also had what you call uh, autonomy, uh, financial autonomy of the federal judiciary. We don't have any issue because their money goes directly uh, to the arm of government, uh, the third arm of government, and they now determine how to disburse the amount. Uh, you have never heard the president of the country uh, buying cars and assembling all the justices of the Supreme Court, all those who are at the federal level, and say, we are giving you uh, these uh, 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 cars, you know, as if it is the president's money that you use in buying those cars. We have also not heard about a situation where the executive have built any legislative quarter and now begin to, you know, uh, call a press conference in order to sound so benevolent. We have not seen such thing happen at the federal level. So we have also expected same to be at the state level. But unfortunately, over time, we've seen that the governors have never allowed those other two arms of government to be financially autonomous. The governors release so much, you know, in bu building houses for National Assembly members in building houses for judges, and they will call a press conference and give an impression as if that money they, are, they hmm. have used in building this hmm. infrastructure came from their own budget, whether this money was belong to the other arms of government. And they're supposed to have gotten this money in the first place in order to buy their car. They will decide whether they want to buy a car or whether they want to use it to put into in basic infrastructure at the judiciary. But we've seen the lawyer, I mean, the, the governors interfering with the financial autonomy of those other two arms and then doing those things ordinary that shouldn't be done by them. And so the constitution has already provided it. And people have been complaining. Why can't we have autonomy, financial autonomy for the state house of assembly? Why can't we have financial autonomy for the state uh, judiciary? And so when this argument became very, very intense and the president saw that these governors were not ready to budge, the president had to now set up a committee that made a recommendation. And it was that recommendation that, that led to the executive order that the president signed presently, giving life to the provision of the constitution in the first place, giving life. And so when an executive order is signed by the, by the executive, giving life to an enactment of a legislature, enactment of the legislature. So anyone says that it's illegal, anyone says that it is wrong, has something to argue, and there is nothing in it, in that argument, because there is no truth in what they are saying concerning what the executive order has done. Rather, the executive order is just giving life to what has already been enacted by the legislature. So that is my, my take in what, you know, that argument of uh, okay. Ekweremadu. Ekweremadu is not being truthful. If Ekweremadu, who is a lawyer, knows is saying the truth, he knows that there has been a constitutional provision giving financial autonomy to the other two arms of government. So why have they not obeyed? Why have they observed those provisions in breach? And what is it that the president has, has done in terms of, you know, doing the wrong thing by now is, you know, signing into law an executive order, giving life to that enactment that has been made that is already there in the constitution. So I don't see anything that has been that has been done wrongly by the president. And so the argument of uh, of equity matter is non sequitur. It goes to no issue at all. Okay. Um, before we go further into those uh, legal, uh, we call it jargons. But let's stay on, still on this issue before we, I cite you some of the examples I mentioned. Now the executive yeah. order. We are supposed to have a first-line deduction from source. That's the first-line church. And that is where yes. this stuff should be coming from. As we speak, which you mentioned, the presidency wants to help the judiciary. They want to help the legislature at the state level who probably could not look into the eyes of the executive governors. Having helped them thus far, do we have an implementation? And, or this is just a political correctness, so to say. Well, I, I, I think when the president signed that uh, executive order, I, I had expected that the following month uh, there would be an implementation because the argument, the, I mean, the arrangement is that if there is any particular state uh, government that is clearly in breach, the first line charge, the money before they take their uh, normal money, uh, that, that money will be taken away by the accountant general. And then the attorney general will work and the accountant general will work out the modalities and ensure 
that that money is paid directly to the State House of Assembly and to the state legislatures. But the governors, you know, became upbeat. And they held meetings, several meetings, and had to approach the president. And then were persuasive enough to ask the president to probably subpedal on the implementation, pending the time they will put their house in order. That was my understanding. And up to now, I don't know what is actually happening because we had expected implementation to start immediately. So again, that speaks volume of the character of this government. I see no reason why after executive order has been signed and then all the modalities you know, are stated therein in the executive order, there is delay in implementation. I don't know whether they're playing politics okay. now after that executive order has been signed. But my understanding of that law is that it should have uh, started to be implemented the following month after the signing of the executive order. Thank you so much. for uh, the, Now, let's look at some examples like I promised. Uh, a lot of people will want to remind us about the executive order that Governor of River State also made allusion to. You remember the story of the demolition of that particular hotel. And he said it derived its power from the executive order. Is that part of the infraction the Kuremaru probably is uh, expressing fear about? Now, you, you, cannot, you cannot enact an executive order that will run contrary to the enabling legislation. In other words, if you, are, if you are going to enact an executive order in order to give life to a piece of legislation, you must not prescribe penalty that is different from what is prescribed in the enabling law. I'm sure the, the governor was you know, saying that he enacted a leg, I mean, an executive order in accordance with the Quarantine Act. The Quarantine Act made a provision where the president can issue and certain orders uh, or regulation with regards to any uh, pandemic or any disease affecting certain area or community or certain parts of the country. Where the president fails to issue such a regulation, the state governors is also empowered by that Quarantine Act to issue some regulations and orders in order to give effect to the full implementation of the Quarantine Act. But the Quarantine Act itself made a provision as, as to any breach whatsoever of the regulations, and it does not include demolition. Because demolition of any person's private property means there has been a judicial process where such a pronouncement has been made by the, by the judiciary. And there is no particular provision. It's only penalty, penalty or fine, that the Quarantine Act itself provides in case of any possible breach when a regulation has, or order has been made by either the president or the governor. So if the governor now goes ahead now to now enact an executive order, which does not in any way tally with the express provision of the Quarantine Act, then that can be declared illegal. So the person whose hotel was uh, actually demolished is clearly encouraged to go to court in order to have court pronouncement as to the legality of that executive order. That's why I say that executive order can only give life to a, a piece of legislation. You cannot enact executive order that runs contrary to the express provision of the enabling law. And so that is where uh, Governor Wike got it wrong. And if Governor Wike knows that under our constitution, you cannot in any way exercise any power that is actually authorized to be exercised by the judicial arm of government. It's only the judiciary that can make a pronouncement as to penalty of any breach of the law. It's only the judiciary that can in any way make prescription mm -hmm. as to punishment under the law. And so where the executive is a person that enact law and is the one also, you know, judging that law, that piece of law, at the same time executed, then that is three arms of government being, ex being exercised by one arm of government. That is autocracy. Mm -hmm. That, again, may have given vent to what uh, Mr. Uh, the, Mr. The, the former deputy uh, senior president was alluding uh, to in his statement. Any executive order that runs contrary to the enabling law cannot in any way stand in the face of such authoritarian or you know, illegal uh, application of the executive order. So to me, demolition of a hotel, all in an exercise of executive order that was made pursuant to the Quarantine Act, is clearly illegal because the Quarantine Act itself never made such a provision as an enabling law. Maybe in, in, in perspective, just like um, we will we'll be able to appreciate or disapprove what the Kuremadu did say, let's also look at what happened in Lagos, this Quarantine Act, where we had um, the actress and the husband, you know, being, you know, taken to court. Um, did the Lagos state follow the due process and where 
did they also, you know, erred in law? That particular uh, uh, matter is presently before the Court of Appeal, I understand. Okay. I think there was a time uh, Mr. Femi Falana, uh, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, you know, uh, stated that he's now acting on behalf of the, the actress and, and the husband. Uh, so presently that matter is sub -judice. Okay. So I may not be in a position to make any comprehensive statement, but, you know, uh, be it, uh, let me just say this. So I was one of those that actually criticized the, the penalty that was imposed upon that, that lady and the husband. I don't think that the Quarantine Act made provision for such community service or whatever that was uh, actually meted out to the lady and the husband. And so since the matter is presently pending before the Court of Appeal, I will suspend whatever pronouncement I want to make until the Court of Appeal looks at that piece of uh, legislation and the punishment that was meted out uh, to the actress and, the, and her husband. Okay, thank you for that uh, uh, piece of information too. I think I, I must admit that I didn't know there's already an appeal. But let's look at the process the state government uh, you know, went through in making it a law. Because some would have said that, um, because a lot of the issues have come up after then to say that they just made them the scapegoat. We've had a lot of breaches over time. And people will say that I think the law was quite fast. Is it, the, the, is it coming under this executive order that made it a law then? Or the state government was quite too fast, you know, in making it a law? Which, which of the legislation are requiring to? Is it the one in Lagos or the one the executive order of the president? The, the quarantine act that was now domesticated in Lagos. Oh, okay, no, yeah, you know, you know the, the quarantine act, as I said, as I said earlier, uh, there were a lot of breaches. The, the president himself has uh, made pronouncement as to regulation. If you remember, he uh, asked Lagos State uh, to be uh, to close their borders and then stay indoors for a certain number of weeks, and the same with Ogun State and Abuja. So to, to, to me, the, the president has covered the field concerning those three states. And so it was clearly debatable whether the state governors under this, uh, in the two states, in Ogun State and Lagos, and then even that of Abuja, have any right whatsoever to have made any other regulation. Because whenever the president has made any regulation or order under the Quarantine Act, he has covered the field. Those state governors can no longer in any way issue any other order or mm. any other regulation under the Quarantine Act. Hmm. Oh, I hope we don't have a network issue here. Oh, so sorry. Um, I understand that the network is really... I wish we can have your final comment on this. But if you're not able, I think... Uh, that, that would, okay. Hello, sir. Am I still there? Yeah, you're what here. What I found out with Lagos is that after the president has made a regulation from the Quarantine Act, some of the, the governors was now making an order and regulation again under the Quarantine Act, even when the president has done that. That is why I said that the matter is presently before the Court of Appeal. These are part of the uh, public uh, grants of appeal, whether the governor has any right to make any regulation or order. When the president itself has made a regulation and all that that governs Lagos and Ogun State, that, that that is my take with regards to that. Okay, finally, before you go, uh, probably in the next six seconds, if you can reach, reach some of the points you've made so that we can know both the executive yeah. and legislators may be listening to you now. How do we draw yeah. this line? You've mentioned that uh, executive order must draw its strength from the ground norm, yes. but how do we yes. ensure that we are well guided? Yeah, it is important we, we, say, we say this, you know, with every uh, right of circumspection that in making an executive order, it is not clearly, uh, shouldn't be outside a, a piece of legislation. Because the, uh, the, 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 the tenets of democracy demand that three arms of government must be in operation. We have an arm that executes. We have an arm that actually makes law. We have an arm that interprets. Interpret. And so in, 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 in enacting an executive order, it cannot be a piece of legislation in the sense of being the one that makes the law. No, it is only made in order to carry out an, a piece of the existing legislation. But giving life now to that piece of legislation by executing that piece of law, then you can now make an executive order. It, it, no, it doesn't stand on its own. Executive order that is made that now run contrary to a provision of the law cannot in any way stand if it comes before the judiciary. So the, the executive must understand the purpose of a executive order. The legislat uh, uh, legislators must also understand 
what is the purpose of uh, an executive order. Every executive order derives its strength from an, a piece of existing legislation. Any other executive order that is made that it has variance, that is at variance with a piece of legislation will be declared null and void, if so facto unlawful, not in consonance with the law that gives its li you know, life and all that. So that, again, is something that we need to explain both to those who make law, to those who execute, and to those who interpret. We interpret. For my happiness and joy is that there is always an arm of government that is there to look at every act that is either by way of execution or by way of uh, lawmaking Bridges. to see whether it complies with all known procedures. I mean, it does not comply. They have a right to nullify such act, either executive act or such as a, you know, a piece of legislation that does not conform with the procedure and processes of making law or with the process, process and procedure of executing law or even with the process and procedure of even interpreting the law itself. They con the, the, the judiciary can also overrule itself, you know, and they have done that several times. So that is how democracy works. Okay. All the three arms of government must work, all for the purpose of giving good governance to the people. Thank so you so much. So anyone that goes contrary to the express procedure and process must be declared null and void, must be declared if so facto a nullity, must be declared con unconstitutional. So that Thank is the law. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy that I've had opportunity of explaining this today. Thank you so much. We also appreciate your time. And that is Monday Onye Kachi Ubani. That's where we got the acronym MOU for your time. Monday Oye Kachi Ubani is the former second vice president of Nigerian Bar Association and he has explained to us we're supposed to also have a lawmaker but for one thing or the other we're not able to have them join us. But the conversation will continue on all our social media but still staying with us we'll take a short break now and when we return a notable figure in a state proposes a peace pact. We'll be right back. Please don't go anywhere. <music> 